He's the boss. That's that. You'll do what he says like the rest of us. We all do. You try to give him lip, he'll pull your arms off and eat them before you've shut your trap. The dominance within ogre society is often regulated by two things. Power and guts. The stronger the ogre, the higher up he is in their brutish tribal hierarchy, and the fatter his gut, the more obvious his power is shown to his friends and enemies. The largest and most powerful ogre within the entire kingdom is known as the Overtyrant, the current ruler holding this lofty title being the infamously obese Grisus Goldtooth. Below him stands a large collection of lesser tribal rulers who are slightly less obese, known simply as tyrants, and are typically the rulers of their own tribe or petty kingdom within the mountains of Morn. They naturally rise to rule and do so with an iron fist, literally, for ogres commonly wear bladed gauntlets just for this purpose. The largest ogres under the tyrants are known as the bruisers, and these are contenders for tribal power and assume lesser command duties until they are ready to challenge the tyrant. Dissension within a tribe is handled with sudden and predictable violence, and any who question a tyrant's decisions must be prepared to fight the ruler in a match to the death. Before such a duel, each ogre removes his gut plate, an ominous sign as the victor in such a contest is expected to feast on the guts of the loser. Ogres refer to this traditionally as a guts-out challenge. Ascension to tribal rule is not entirely hereditary, since all an ogre can do is defeat the current tyrant. Yet it does follow a similar, if not gruesome, line of succession. As the most powerful ogres tend to sire the strongest offspring, a tyrant's fiercest challenges will often come from his own progeny. Thus, begets a generational cycle of violence where a tyrant eventually faces his most ambitious and fattest son in a challenge, and to remain as ruler, he must beat down and eat his own rebellious offspring, or be eaten in turn. Ogres being what they are, find this normal and speak proudly of relatives who put up a good showing. Ogre tyrants are bullies of the first degree, and unleashing abrupt violence helps them keep an iron rule over their tribe. A common tradition amongst tyrants is to pull off a limb or two off anyone who offends them, such as those who speak too much, or any ogre that accidentally eats one of the tyrant's favourite nobblers. The commonly used phrase, That'll cost him an arm and a leg, stems from this practice. The arms or legs in question are most often eaten, but some tyrants use them to bludgeon the offender. The ogre tyrant Malbob Mountain Smasher even earned the name Big Arm after pulling a giant's arm out during a friendly dispute. From that day on, Malbob used the massive limb as a club until it started to go off, that is. Uh, then he ate it. The more was born from the fire. The earth shook at its coming. The flames ate many tribes. To the mountains some fled. The ogre race, no matter what kingdom or lands they hail from, all pay homage to a ravenous, all-consuming god known in their tongue simply as the Great Moor. The Great Moor, alongside its lesser offspring, the Fire Mouth, are the primary and sole deities of the ogre race. All ogres pay homage to these malevolent deities, not out of any sense of love or admiration, but one of total raw fear. The Great Moor was the one responsible for the near destruction of the ogre race, remember. Their once beautiful and plentiful homeland, now a scorched and barren wasteland, as punishment for their sins. It was the great moor that now cursed the ogre's once full bellies into gaping holes from which no amount of food or substance could ever hope to fill. 
from the moment of its arrival, no ogre could ever dare to question its existence, for all he has to do is listen to the hunger which growls within his guts, to know that the curse the great Moor has placed upon their race is tangible. There are a great many social and often religious rituals shared by all the tribes that make up the Ogre Kingdoms, of which the most important are feasts. Feasts are special meals with the entire tribe present that can last for days or even weeks. Consuming meat is a religious matter for the ogres, for to eat a thing is to show superiority over it, and it is a way of emulating the great Moor, their all-consuming deity. Feasts aren't just about eating, and central to any major event are contests. Some are light-hearted sport for boasting rights, such as belching contests or nobbler fighting, but most are strength tests, such as gut barging, face cracking and the like. Championship rounds are fought in the pit, while the rest of the tribe cheers and jeers. Leadership challenges and personal grudges are often fought during special feasts, and regardless of the outcome, whoever wins will doubtlessly hoist himself out of the moor pit and call for yet more feasting. Only an over-tyrant can call a great feast, a gathering of all tribes. The top ogres from every tribe travel vast distances to make a great feast. Dragging with them the largest game they or their associated hunters can kill, especially gifted ogres, the loudest bellower, for instance, are given the honour of carrying the tribe's moortooth. Upon arrival of the great feast, each moortooth is placed around the moor pit, recreating the fanged hole that is the ogre deity. Greasus Goldtooth, the current overtyrant and ruler of the Goldtooth tribe, is especially known for his massive weeks-long events, where gifts are given to loyal tribes and the disfavoured often meet misfortune in bloody and spectacular fashion. Pray hark to brave Sir Baldrin's tale, who travelled far to the mountain vale to slay an ogre fiend or drake, and meet his lady of the lake. Dismounting now, Sir Baldrin strode, further still up the mountain road, from nook and cranny, hungry eyes did stare, then widened in despair. And thus it was, that ogre fowl stepped out and gave a fearsome growl, I'll grind your bones to make my bread. And the knight replied, I'll have your head. Sir Baldrin charged with great sword raised. His downward stroke the ogre grazed. The monster's club came arching down and landed hard on Baldrin's crown. There came a grisly snapping sound. The knight was pitched unto the ground. But here Baldrin's tale does not end. What awaits our Breton eye friend? <laughs> Ogre society is centred around two important aspects of their culture and way of life. Eating and fighting. And we can see the parallel here between strength and size of gut being the main factors that affect the Ogre's status in the hierarchy and eating and fighting is the two main aspects of their culture and way of life. Ogres frequently challenge each other to contests of physical strength, especially on feast days or during a bout of ogre games. These contests are also used as leadership challenges. They range from the relatively light-hearted belching contest, where the worst an ogre can expect is to be showered by gobbets of saliva and half-eaten food, to bouts of pit fighting, a lethal blood sport that has gained popularity in the old world. It is permitted, in fact expected, that an ogre pit fight will involve weaponry of some sort. This generally includes iron fists, heavy chains, punch daggers and bladed helmets. Suffice to say, the pit fights staged by mankind are pale in comparison 
bloodless and tame next to the extreme violence of an ogre bout. Another favourite ogre game is gut barging, held in higher esteem than such pastimes as face cracking or fist splinter, for it is as much about the girth as it is might. Each ogre grabs hold of his opponent's belt and attempts to force his opponent to the floor with a combination of strength and weight. His efforts centred on the gut. Sinews strain and muscles bulge, with neither combatant giving an inch, until after much belching, spitting, threatening and roaring, much of which comes from the audience, one ogre finally buckles and is forced to the dirt. If both ogres survive an ogre game, the winner is permitted to eat a part of the loser as a victory spoil. Should the contest be recreational or merely to ascertain who gets first cut of a slain foe, this may be a couple of fingers, an ear or a nose. However, if the game in question is brought about by a leadership challenge, argument over land or personal grudge, the rivals remove their gut plates before the bout, a very serious sign. The victor in a gut-out contest will invariably beat the loser to death with his bare hands and eat his bloody corpse then and there in front of the cheering audience. In this way, the ogre not only gained the strength of the vanquished opponent, but also the respect of his tribe. Many of these recreational and ceremonial games are staged during or after an ogre feast, when the tribe is well fed and the games therefore become less likely to turn into a full-scale bloodbath. Feasts are of religious importance to the ogres, and given enough meat, they will take any excuse to hold one. The guest of honour at these feasts will sit at the right hand of the tyrant's throne, and is therefore permitted the second finest cut of the meat. In practice, this is often the hunters that took down and brought the meat back to the tribe in the first place. Hallmarks of an ogre feast include fireplaces the size of stables, and massive trough-like trestle tables around the edge of a moor pit. A sinking, stinking hole in the ground filled with a morass of rotting meat, body parts and busted weaponry in which the ogres fight their bloody games. Although other races might employ minstrels at a feast, ogres have no real concept of music and prefer volume above skill Thus, an ogre who can shout louder than his fellows is considered a gifted performer. Their feasts resound with bellowing, hollering and belching, as well as the omnipresent crunch of meat and bone. <laughs> However, the butchers know full well that their tribe appreciates diversity of the meat as well and as much as the next cave full of predators. Whilst the traditional eating songs resound through the feast halls, the butchers punctuate steaming platefuls of cave beast with raw Bretonian and wild garlic, tough dwarf meat served in a Gromril case, thick sausages stuffed with the finest empire soldiery, and widely seen as a delicacy, tender elf legs fried in horse blood. This is usually washed down with ogre beer, a thick, viscous and foul concoction with equal quantities of honeycomb and hornet swimming in its murky depths. Ogre beer is intoxicating enough to hospitalise a dwarf and is commonly taken from a drinking horn snapped from the skull of a beast the owner has killed himself. The greatest feasts are staged after the defeat and subsequent ransacking of a great caravan. The mile-long trading convoys that crawl through the Badlands towards the Ogre Kingdoms and finally Cathay. These armoured land trains are invariably well defended, often by rival ogre tribes. But when a predatory ogre tribe does finally manage to conquer one, it finds itself knee-deep in luxury goods, gold and quality firewood. An ogre tribe can subsist on the sacking of a single great caravan for a full month, if not more, and the subsequent feast is often a week-long orgy of food and drink that is heard for miles around. Sadly, these occasions are becoming rare, 
as the iron rule of trade lord Greasus Goldtooth, the over-tyrant, forces the tribes into a new era of mercenary activity and cooperation with the human race. Slowly but surely, the ogre kingdoms have become aware that gold is just as valuable as meat, and far more likely to last the winter. His guts were gobbled then and there, the rest dragged back to ogre's lair. Sir Baldrin's heart, so stout and true, took pride of place in wholesome stew. His legs were chewed, his fingers grilled, his lungs with garlic butter filled. Bones were snapped and marrow bled, then powdered into ogre bread. Chainmail fitted ogre's arm, though not with Baldrin's dandy charms. His great sword once a weapon dire, spitted meat on an open fire. His icon now thrown into the hearth, his breastplate now a goblin's bath. His blanket used to stuff a hole, his skull now a hollow drinking bowl. So then this Bretonian's fate would met upon an ogre's plate. Let ye be warned when eastward bound, pray take some friends, lest ye be found. Ogres have lived as tribal creatures since their earliest days on the plains. These bands allow ogres to take what they want, whether in battle or on the hunt, as few can stand against a bulky wall of oncoming ogres. A tribe can range in size from a few dozen individuals to larger groups consisting of many hundreds. Yet regardless of an ogre tribe's size, it is organised according to a recognisable hierarchy that follows proud ogre tradition. To ensure their tribe stays strong, any weak or gangly offspring are weeded out by throwing them into caves as offerings to the Great Moor. It is a grim but practical outlook, for ogres require a lot of food, and only those strong enough to hunt or fight can survive. Although this primitive form of eugenics is something they have in common, the ogre kingdoms are made up of hundreds of different tribes, and they all have their own ways and violent reputations between them. As ogres are blunt and obvious, the tribal name often reflects the most overt of the tribal traits. For instance, the Skulltaker tribe have attained prominence for their successful hunts, and the borders of their kingdom are well marked with the skulls of beasts so large they defy belief. While the Treehammers tribe is known for carrying oversized clubs, and the bloody fists are recognised by their distinctive war markings made from the blood of their enemies. Each tribe attempts to better its own reputation, a feat most often done in the traditional ogre way, that is, through prodigious acts of violence. For example, the Flesh Greeders, led by their immense tyrant Nogflag the Gouted, would pile everything in a conquered territory that couldn't be carried off or immediately eaten into a single immense mound before erecting a crude throne atop it. Nogflag would climb the pile to sit imperiously atop the throne during the victory feast. Following the festivities, the ogres would stomp off, leaving their enormous monument of destruction behind, clearly marked with their tribal symbols. It was possible to follow the trail of the flesh greeders when they left the mountains of Morn, for they left behind them several of these mounds in all the various villages, fortresses and lairs that they dismantled. Regardless of their differing traits, most ogre tribes reside within their own valley in the mountains of Morn, at least for a time. Ogres rarely spend too long in a single location, a combination of their wanderlust, nomadic heritage, and the general perception that remaining sedentary attracts the ire of their frightful deity. Although never spoken aloud, it is ogre belief that If you stay in one place too long, the sky will fall on you. While in a valley this means travelling between campsites, packing and resetting their great hide-covered huts, digging new moor pits and the like. After a while, however, even this becomes too cramped, and a tyrant will lead his way on a journey, sometimes going far off into the world at large, wreaking as much destruction as they can as they go.
Besides their weapons, the ogre tribes typically carry few possessions and so are ready to move at all times. One of a tribe's most valued items is its maw tooth, a stone that bears the tribe's scrawled marks and sigils. This icon is carried to every location and placed prominently in every new camp, often near the tyrant's hut or in the ring of giant stones that encircle some ogre camps. Ogres see other tribes as competitors for food, and it is best to demonstrate to others that your tribe has larger and more powerful warriors. To this end, ogres constantly engage in highly visible feats of strength, such as climbing sheer cliffs, hurling immense boulders, or pulling hydras out of their rocky dens. Fighting between tribes is common, and usually concludes with the weaker tribe being absorbed by the victor sometimes literally. Tribes do not always battle, and there are occasions when it is advantageous to work together. For example, when the barbaric men from the north last swept from the chaos wastes in great numbers, they were repelled by an alliance between the Bloody Fists and the Mountain Eaters. That great victory is still celebrated by the two tribes, who meet yearly to hold a spawn roast. At times, the tribes have been united underneath an over-tyrant, a ruling king that holds power over all the other tyrants. It takes a powerful individual to hold even minor leverage over distant tribes, much less rule over them. But when there is an over-tyrant, it is far more common for multiple tribes to band together to conquer larger territories, vast armies of ogres descending upon the world and smashing aside all opposition to take what they want. 